bow our heads and pray as we get to scripture. Our Father God, we want to just as we stop and think what worship is. Sometimes it's a challenging activity. We sometimes aim to engage in a dialogue with something that we can't see. We meet with someone we are not able to see. Sometimes it's difficult. For us, with all that's on our minds, and as we come here, Father, we do pray that you would speak to us through your word and as we look at the whole thing of in preparing to worship, that this is the issue. You clear in your word about that, God. And we just do pray that as we approach it, you give us hearts that would be willing to listen and be willing to make changes in our lives as we read your word. In your precious name we pray. <coughs> yes. I think it's a good way to start, isn't it? Sometimes we don't know how we come here to worship. And once the singing is over, or even when the singing is on, sometimes we find it challenging. Who am I singing to? I can't see this person I'm worshipping. I'm, I'm supposed to see him, I'm supposed to meet him here, but how does that happen? I can't fail to overstate, I mean, I can't be overstating it if I say that preparation to worship is the key thing. And we can imagine if, if there are times when we may have not come here well prepared to worship Christ. May, you may have gone home with a lost opportunity. Or look at it, let's look at it the other way. If we have come well prepared, we have really done a good thing and have given sacrifice of praises to our living God. And that's satisfying to know that we're able to do that. And we're able to do that and have a rich time of fellowship every time we come here. And it's not a new concept. If Carl has touched upon it in, through various Psalms, that he read through. But Psalm 14, does say, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in the holy hill? He who walks uprightly, works righteousness, speaks in the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue. And he gives us that whole list there. He who does these things shall never be moved. And the same thought, you can go on further, Psalm 24. Lord, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. And if you go on further as well, you... The concept is that when the Israelites had to, they maybe thrice a year they went up to the to Zion to worship, and they had to prepare themselves for that worship. And they even have the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 120, 124, which goes on there. Those are Psalms of Ascent, and they, and Greg has taken us through that series when he spoke on worship. 122, 134. And that's how they prepared. Last time when we looked at worship, when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, the conversation which turned to worship, the concern was not only about where worship was done, but how worship was done. And when you look at, we had to worship God in spirit and truth, interwoven and all that is the concept of how we prepare ourselves to worship. And we did sort of conclude that time that it is possible to come to church and still miss worship. And a good preparation will likely be the key to make that difference. So to sum up a bit of what we did last time was 
must approach worship in a correct understanding of who we worship, what we're doing, and then do it. Okay, we saw that it's an act of reverence, adoration, praise, and homage to God. It's an external act motivated by an experience of expression of an internal sentiment. We saw that it's not just a spectator sport. Okay, just come back and listen to what others are doing. But we need to worship together. In truth and in spirit. This is what we saw. And that preparing to, to worship in the spirit, it means to prepare our hearts to worship. It needs a bit of planning, planning ahead. To prepare your heart long before arriving. Good rest the previous night. Good relationship. Mind, preparing your mind is vital for true worship. And of course, creating an environment that's conducive to true worship is important. But it begins with the heart. We need to minimize hindrances and distractions. setting needs to be decent, orderly. We've been told of that in Corinthians as well. It shouldn't be confusing. Some distractions are unavoidable and, and we can't predict them and we, we understand that. Medical emergencies. Children. Don't stop from bringing children. We love to have them in our church. It's a good way to train them to be in, uh, bring them. Those distractions we can put, we, we, we love that. Some can be avoided. Whispering, talking, passing notes, even toilet breaks. So those are just the external things that one can do. And it's much deeper than that. But you might be confused at this time. You think, <laughs> but last time you said that worship is, is everything. Your whole life is worship. Now what is this preparation to worship? And if you come here every Sunday and, and make this time just a ritual then you lost if you fail to do this in private you'll have a problem doing it when you're here together if you fail to worship in private you'll have a problem doing that when you come here together how can we do that how can we avoid this ritualism and that brings me back to a point I touched on last time, which is, what is the dimension of worship? I mean, who are we? Is it just me praising God? Yes, we touched very briefly on it last time, but worship has this outward dimension. Giving to others is an act of worship. Sharing the gospel with others is an act of worship. How we treat our fellow believers is an act of worship. You can, Romans, we'll be going to Romans 14, 15, talk well of that, when he talks of that as acceptable worship. In Philippians, Paul talks about giving money to meet the needs. That's an act of worship. So worship is that outward act, act of sharing your love, sharing the gospel, sharing your resources. That exalts and honors and glorifies God. And that puts Him on display in your life. And shows that you're obedient to Him. Then there's that inward dimension of how, whether you are pleasing God. Whether you're living a life of goodness, righteousness, truth. If those are the external, those are the internal ones. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. In other words, being holy. Living a life of goodness, honesty. And then the upward dimension, of course, is praising God and giving Him thanks. In Hebrews 13, 15 says, By Him, through Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. When we come to worship, we sing, we praise God with our heart, our lips. We say thanks. 
But as you can see from those dimensions, is that worship is for every day. Not just Sundays. It has to be a way of life. So this whole preparation of worship is intertwined. It's a cycle. We, when we come together in the assembly of saints to worship God, that should be an extension of a worshiping life. Otherwise, true, true worship will not occur here. If we are not living our lives through the week in an act of worship to God, when we come here together, we're not going to have that true worship. Carl did read from Hebrews 10. It goes on to say, in fur- further on, is that what is the purpose of us coming here together? To be inspired And then further, it stimulates us to worship during the rest of the week. Our worship on Sunday, when we come here together, together, let us draw near with a true heart, not forsaking the assembly of saints. Why? Because verse 24 in Hebrews tells, we have to come together to stimulate one another for love and to do good works. One feeds the other. As we get stimulated, affect your soul, we go out to good and share others, and then we come back into the assembly, we praise God, and that's a continual cycle of worship. So the preparation to worship is in itself a cycle. Some aspects of it are are one, one, four, and we'll come to that. But just to touch on that worship cycle, you know, some of us say, well, I've got so many problems in my Christian life. I can't be committed to be consistent. You know, there are some people who actually say, I live my whole life, whole week, I, I glorify God through what I do. But on Sundays, I need my space. I can't come here and do what I have to do. That doesn't gel, does it? Or you might say, I come here every Sunday, I do great, but look, I've got my work for the rest of the week. No, guys, we need to understand that either you're worshipping six days of the week and not worshipping on Sunday or worshipping just on Sunday and not the six days of the week. That doesn't gel. We need both. If you go to church just when it's convenient, you know, you're not going to get this together. You've got to be faithful, consi- consistent to love and good works for the body of people to bring you to bear to life. I just want to draw us to a passage that really talks about what is this preparation of worship. As I said, if you're doing it for the rest of the week, in those dimensions I told you about, you'll be doing, getting it right when you come here every Sunday and we'll be having a great time worshipping God together and He will be blessed and you'll go home blessed. You'll have a great week because it'll stimulate you to worship Him through all the things that we said. And you'll come back the next week charged and ready to give him more worship, and we all will be blessed, and the church will be blessed. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll read from verse 19 to 24, 5. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together 
as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That one verse is a great, in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Is really the true sum of what it means to be, to prepare. And if you just break it up, it's just the first bit is the invitation. Let us draw near. That's a call to worship. As uh, so what are we, who are we drawing near to? God. And he says, the, the writer is saying, come, it's time to worship. Let's draw near and move toward God. Literally means to come facing, for, facing toward and to approach or come near. You're coming to associate with or, or visit describes an approach or entry into the presence of the deity. So in the Old Testament, this was uh, used to describe the approach to the priest of Jehovah for worship and to perform their Levitical functions. But here in Hebrews, under the New Covenant, it's been referred seven times in, in this book. It refers to believers possessing the privilege of access to God the Father, to Christ, who is the great high priest. And that's what we are to do. Let us draw near. What a privilege we have. And an invitation by God through what He's done for us on the cross by creating this open access to Him. He's given us the invite, folks. Let us draw near to Him. Let's have boldness to draw near to Him. There shouldn't be any thought of any weakness holding you back. It's God who set the door open and calls you in. And you need to come in boldness. Nothing can hinder. You say, yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to draw near, but what do I do now? And that's when the rest of the verse, he gives us an inventory, sort of, a list for that preparation. So the first is, yes, we need to draw near, but what's with her? Genuine, a sincere, a true heart. Are you really sincere? Is your heart fixed on undivided? Are you worshipping here with your whole heart? That word sincere has lots of meanings. One is true, one who cannot lie from. And it's the opposite of counterfeit, imaginary or pretended. It describes those who are characterized by integrity and trustworthiness, those who are true and dependable. Is that what describes you in your heart today when you come here? Are you coming and drawing near in His presence with a sincere heart? Genuine heart. Or are you here sitting, oh, look at what Benji is saying. Oh, this is this, he's not saying this right, this is wrong. This wrong. No, you'll find lots of faults in what I'm saying. I'm a human. I'm here not, is that what you're here for? You've got it wrong, buddy. If you're here to worship God with all sincerity, you've got it right. Surrender your heart to God. Matthew 15, 79, when he saw that, he said, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips. We sang all the good things, we said all the good things, but the hearts are far from me. They worship me and were vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. That's the last thing I want to hear from God. If he looks at me and calls me, you hypocrite. 
We worship Him with your lips, but your heart is far from Him. We need to be committed to God. We can go through the motions of worship, but it will be meaningless unless our heart is right with Him. That's not superficial, that's not hypocritical. No ulterior motive. You know, when it talks about heart, in the scripture we know it never talks about the organ of the heart. It does sometimes, but the word, when in this place, it's always used figuratively to describe the seat, the center of human life, the center of our personality. The thing that controls us, which directs us, our intellect, our emotions, our will. That's the heart he's talking about. In Romans, Paul dealt with the heart. I mean, he discusses the genuineness of salvation of the, of the Jews. He says, it's not just the outward obedience. It's not just the outward rituals that you're doing. It's not just your, whether you're circumcised or not. But is your heart circumcised? It's the inward, the spiritual, supernatural work that God has done in your life. A genuine heart is the one that has gone, undergone supernatural circumcision. And that's the problem through the ages. The nation of Israel, Judah, they... they they kept doing this. Anything but a sincere heart in Jeremiah, it says. But God has clearly given us the opportunity. He's given us the invitation. He's made it possible for us to come into His presence. But the first condition is, or inventory that we need to look into is, is my heart genuine? The second is, Am I loyal to the faith? Is it? When it says a full assurance of faith, you can draw a few meanings from that, but to the Hebrews to whom the epistle was written, I think they were still trying to hold on to the old covenant and the old things that they were doing. The new covenant had become in Jesus Christ and they had to say no to the old covenant in order to worship God. There are no more ceremonies, sacrifices, symbols, pictures, nothing of that. The old was gone. And they had to become willing to say, I'm coming to God in full confidence and assurance that I'm no longer under a system of works or ceremony, but I come fully by faith in Christ Jesus. And we may have our own baggage that we are willing, not willing to let go of. Maybe I, ca I can come here, but look, I'm an intellectual guy. I, I know what it, what it means. I can work this out. This is just too simple for me. I'm, I'm what is this? It's fine. I understand this. I understand totally what Christ has done for me, but. Now this, my intellect is getting in my way. My pride is getting in my way. We may not have the same rituals or baggages that the Israelites had. We have subtle differences. But even now, I know heaps of my relatives, friends who, are, who have been, who have had the experience of salvation and have been in, in really traditional sort of faith or, or churches before. They find it difficult to get rid of those old rituals and, and, and things that they used to do. I'm sure if there's anything like that, it hinders us from worship. The full assurance of faith. The whole idea is being filled with a thought, a conviction. not only to worship God with genuineness, but to worship according to the truth revealed 
in the word of God. In full assurance that is a saving truth. You don't have to do anything more. You're not to hang on to any of your works for your own worthiness, for your own self-righteousness. If I come totally out here, then what about all the good things I do? No one will recognize them as my things. No, it's not about you. You have to be fully assured that you can come to God simply and only through faith. Let us draw near the fullness of faith. The third thing there is having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That requires humility. We must come to God with the knowledge that we are unworthy to be in His presence. I don't know, I know we don't like to hear that. There have been times when I've been told after a service, that's not right, you shouldn't keep saying that. But it's the truth. I'm unworthy to be in His presence. My heart is filled with an evil conscience. And the only reason I can come to God is because I've been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that has, that He shed for the blood for me on the cross to take care of my sins and clean my heart from, from it. So when I come to worship, there's a sense of humility and unworthiness. I have no business to be in the presence of God. Except for the fact that God has sprinkled me clean from the evil that is in me. I would love to come gloated with all that I've done and say I deserve to be here. I'd love to gloat. Look, I've saved lives. I'm a doctor. I look after people. That's nothing. I'm still unworthy to be in His presence. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's God's promise to Israel in Chronicles. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. He's done that. You don't have to do that every time. He's done that as salvation for you. But the effects of it are ongoing. We are to come having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. This is typical of the high priest who, before he could approach God, had to be sprinkled with blood of the sacrifice. And then he had to wash everything and kept washing and washing the things. Those are external, those are the external features. But it takes more than that. Only Jesus can clean the man's heart. Our innermost thoughts, our innermost desires. If we can fool everyone with all our external and outward show that we can put on. If you all look into your own hearts, I'm sure you'll see that extent of hypocrisy that we all have carried with us. But the conscience is the key word in this epistle. We need to have a clear conscience. doesn't mean that we have never sinned or do not commit an act of sin. It means that the underlying direction and motive of life is to obey and please God. How is your conscience today? Is it clear or is it clouded? You don't need to be afraid. Because He's given the invitation. He calls you to come in genuine faith. Fully loyal to his assurance of faith. In humility. But cleanliness and purity as well. He says, not only just sprinkling our hearts, but our bodies washed with pure water. 
This is a daily washing. We need to deal with the sin in our lives through confession. Even though our hearts were cleaned at the cross, our feet are still pick up the dust of the world, is what one great man of God said. Our hearts were cleansed at the cross, but our feet still pick up the dust of the world. There must be a confessing of sin. Our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. If we are to draw near with hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, we must also have a body washed with pure water. And this can only be enjoyed in life which is every action is clean, cleansed by his word. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? He who has a clean hand and a pure heart. A heart sprinkled with the blood. A body washed with pure water from every sin. Repentance, guys. Repentance, confession and repentance are the key for preparing your heart for worship. If there's sin in my life, if there's sin in your life, you have to accept the responsibility for it and confess it. We've seen in David's life, in 2 Samuel. You know, he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, and after she had, he had her husband murdered. And they had a child born of that union, and that child died. And after all that, what did he say? David rose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. In the midst of that tragic situation, the loss of his son, he worshipped God. You know why? Because he knew that he was receiving what he deserved. In the midst of that chastening from God, he worshipped. Some of us can't worship because we've never dealt with our sin. We haven't poured out our heart in repentance to God. We are even angry sometimes with Him. We are bitter about some of the things. How did He teach me that lesson? Look at that. He's doing the same sin. He's not getting the lesson. Why am I being given that lesson? And we are angry with God for that. If that's the situation with you, you have to overcome and repent of your sin. Make sure you are right with God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So every time you worship, prepare yourself by asking these questions. Have I got a genuine heart? Is my when I'm coming here, is my heart devoted to God? Am I focusing on Him? Am I seeing Him in the, in the Word, or am I seeing the preacher? Is my hunger and desire to draw near to Him? Is that the primary reason I've come here? I want to draw near to you, God. Am I assured that I can simply come by faith and that's all I have to do, not, nothing else? Full assurance of faith. Or with the knowledge that I'm here because of what Christ has done and nothing that I deserve through humility. I've come here with purity, having confessed and got right with all the relationships that you may be wrong with. I want to quote Tozer says, no one can know the true grace of God who has not first known the fear of God. No one can know the true grace of God who has not first known the fear of God. He said, it seems to me that we have lost some of that reverential fear. 
sometimes we are overly and inappropriately familiar with the Almighty. We relate to God as a great gift giver in the sky. And when we do this, we diminish who He is. Before we meet with God, we must remind ourselves we are about to meet with God. He is holy, folks. We are sinners in need of grace and mercy. He is all powerful. We are weak. He is all wise. We can only see the present. He is the creator. We are the created. He should be the standard with which we define and measure our lives. Are you sincere? Are you committed to the truth of the new covenant? Are you placing all your rights to your access to God only on the finished work of Christ? Are you pure? Having dealt with the sin in your life. If you are, then draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Let's pray. Our Father, we can do nothing but just be filled with awe and reverence for you, O Lord. For the work you've done for us. Unworthy as I am. Father, I thank you for giving me the invitation to draw near to you. And help me to prepare my heart as I come to worship you each week having lived a life that is worshipful to you throughout the week. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this word. In your precious holy name we pray, Lord Jesus.